So I'm uh, coming to you again with the second part of my message called Return to God. Uh, we're continuing this theme from uh, James uh, chapter four. I just want to quickly recap on um, the first part of my message last week, part one. Uh, so we looked at James four verses one to six, isn't we? Uh, we looked at how fights and quarrels kind of happen and, and what what's the, the motives behind that. And James says it's the evil desires within us. But we, we touched on the, the effect that it has on us as believers, how it spills out onto our family and our friends and people within church. And uh, actually the negative impact that it has, not only on those going through that situation, those being brought into that situation, but actually what a negative impact that has um, on our witness for Christ. Uh, we looked at our prayer life. James says you, you don't have because you don't ask, you ask amiss. Um, we looked at what are we praying for, what are we asking for, what are the motives of our prayer, what is the, the, the desire, what the intention of our prayer, what, what's that to, to bring. We looked again at the commandment that Jesus gave to love one another. And finally, we've started to look at humility and how important that is in our walk, our daily walk with Jesus. So we're going to look at James uh, chapter 4 verses 6 to 12 today it says but he gives more grace therefore he says God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble and in uh, one of my versions in the New King James Version uh, it kind of has headings for certain segments of scripture and this this heading for this certain certain segment of scripture about to read it says humility cures worldliness I think that's really really powerful and important therefore submit to god resist the devil and he will flee from you draw near to god and he will draw near to you what a great promise cleanse your hands you sinners and purify your hearts you double-minded lament and mourn and weep let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom humble yourselves in the sight of the lord and he will lift you up we looked at verse uh, six last week uh, about the importance of being humble before the Lord. Humility being the cure to our selfish and evil desires. Humility cures worldliness, it says, um, as the heading of that part of scripture we just read in, in the New King James Version. So I mentioned last week that the importance of staying humble before, before the Lord. Uh, and I've, I've coined a phrase, and I don't know if I've pinched it from someone. If I have, then... Um, I give them full credit, whoever it was, but um, I'd rather stay humble before God than be humbled by him. So I won't go over verse six um, in much detail because we covered it um, uh, last week. But verse um, uh, seven says, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Making the point again, uh, focusing our surrender and returning to God, submitting our wills, our plans, our desires to him. Almost to use a, a sporting analogy, throwing in the towel. Or, you know, if you've studied any wars, if there's been a, a time of surrender, what's the sign? People waving the white flag of surrender. I'm playing a game at the moment that I'm becoming a little bit um, competitive on. It's a tower defence game that I just have some time to unwind. Um, and you can surrender. You can wave the white flag if you're going to lose. Um, so that kind of that just in my thought is in my, in my process at the moment. But... Um, surrendering our wills our plans our desires to God and say no Lord I'm going to submit my plans and my desires again to you that's the first point then you can resist the devil because you've surrendered to God's plans you can now stand firm against the enemy because you're not trying to battle him in your own plans Do you know Rob brought us that encouraging message in the um, a few weeks ago again around the armor of God and it mentions a number of times to stand stand firm and I say again stand you can stand against the enemy with the armor because that will help us resist the devil to stand against him against his temptations verses 7 to 10 it says therefore submit to God resist the devil and he will flee from you draw near to God and he will draw near to you cleanse your hands you sinners and purify your hearts you double-minded lament and mourn and weep let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy into gloom humble yourselves in the sight of the lord and he will lift you up church can i encourage you to draw near to god draw near to him 
in those three verses we've just read, there's five points to help us draw near to God. We've already mentioned it. Point number one is submit to God. Uh, chapter four, verse seven. Yield to God. Yield to his will. Yield to his authority. Lay your life down and say, Lord, here's my life for you. Resist the devil. Seven, uh, uh, chapter seven, uh, verse seven again, sorry. Don't allow Satan to tempt you and entice you. Don't allow his schemes um, to, to distract you from drawing near to God. You know, the Bible says that he goes round like a, like a prowling lion, looking to kill, seek and devour. If you give him the opportunity, uh, and I was talking to one of my mentors years ago about this, and he said, the enemy is like that lion prowling on the street. And he, he said, just imagine you're in your house and the lion's outside prowling in the street. As long as you are, the, the door and the, the house is protecting you, the lion's not going to get in. If you go out and you go and engage him, then the lion's going to get you. If you're in, a, in, a, in a, an area of weakness, if there's an area of, 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 of vulnerability, that's where the enemy is going to try and get in. So resist him by not allowing yourself to be in that position. Point number three, Wash your hands and purify your hearts, verse 8. That's talking about living a holy life for Christ, being cleansed from our sin and let the work of Jesus and that, that transforming work in our life that he's doing, let it shine, let it shine for him. I heard an incredible message last night and Nathan was preaching about let the light shine. But let that light of what Jesus has done in you transform you and let that shine, let that purifying light shine in you allow the holy spirit to work in your life and replace the evil desires in us and to replace it with a desire to please god point number four and this is a bit of a, a strange one because we're told that he turns our mourning into dancing and our, our sorrow into joy but james says grieve mourn wail in sincere sorrow for your sins verse nine don't be afraid to express a deep heartfelt sorrow for what you've done i i love seeing some of the videos that shake the nation's team put on seeing the miracles the signs the wonders the uh, just the the mass crusades and, and gospel campaigns that are happening and there's the the thousands of people gathering but i always love to see people's response to when they encounter god and there's a great video from the highlight video that we've seen recently of, of just this young lad, just tears rolling down his face. And I remember in America, Dr. Sandy always used to say um, that um, he had this expression uh, that people would cry more tears over the death of a dog than the death of a saviour, the death, the, the death of their saviour. That there wasn't a, a maybe just that realization or that full expression of actually realizing what Christ has done for us. And actually there was no deep heartfelt sorrow for what we've done, that the sins that we've committed, Jesus paid the price. Um, so I'm not asking you to, to go into a time of, uh, of, of mourning, <laughs> of, of, um, of, of, of lamenting in that sense, but let's be honest and real. For some people, they're not going to because that's not their nature. So I'm not asking you to do something that is um, that is it, you wouldn't be comfortable with. But have a deep, heartfelt sorrow for what we've done, our, our sins, our sins that nailed him to the cross, our sins that put the Son of God, the Lamb of God, on the cross for us. And when you look at the cross, when you see what Jesus did, you can't help. But then the next step is humble yourself before the Lord. Chap uh, chapter 4, verse 10. He will lift the humble. 1 Peter 5, verse 6 says, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Do you know, we don't have to be afraid when we're standing against the enemy if we do these things, if we draw near to God. Because when we draw near to him, we realize who we are in him. And church, we're on the winning side. We've read the end of the book. We know Jesus wins and is victorious. We know that the cross, he defeated Satan and death. 
Revelation 12, uh, 10 and 12 says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of the brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows he has a short time. Do you know when Christ returns, the devil and all that he stands for will be destroyed and eliminated forever. Revelation 20, 10 to 15. The devil who deceived them, who cast Sorry, the devil who sinned was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were open, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and the sea and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Satan is here for now, not for long. And he's trying to win us over to his evil cause. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can resist him and he will flee from us. You know, and it takes a, a turn. James has, has mentioned those few things and, and talk about those five kind of reasons how we can draw close to God and then he, he shifts direction verses 11 and 12 he says do not speak evil of one another brethren who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law but if you judge the law you are not a doer of the law but a judge there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy who are you to judge another and you know James hits the nail on the head We've worked our way through through the, the last few chapters and we worked our way through chapter three and the, the power of the tongue and taming the tongue. And he talks about um, out of the same tongue, that is, is, which is poisonous, which is like a fire, which is set on fire from from hell. And yet you, you bless your God in one mouth with the same mouth and then out of the same mouth you curse. How can that be? And he, he talks about the great damage that that can cause. And that reminds us not to speak evil of one another. We've just looked at those fights and those quarrels amongst you. And, and, and we, 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 it starts, doesn't it, with, with our mouths. It starts with our tongue. It starts with the, the words that we say. And, you know, it's so hard. And I'm being really honest and open with you. Keeping that right attitude and not speaking evil of others when they've spoken evil of you is difficult. You know, the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12.20. For I'm afraid that when I come, I, might, I may not find you as I want you to be. And you may not find me as you want me to be. I love his honesty <laughs> there. I fear that there may be discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance and disorder. Church, that's why we need the Holy Spirit working in us. You know, it's so hard managing my emotions and reactions to things that happen in church. Do you remember a few weeks ago when we had our in conversation with within Williams uh, and I asked him highs and lows of ministry. And he said they both involve people. The highs of, of, of ministry involve people walking into everything that God has for them. The lows of ministry is, is being being around people and being hurt by what what the situations uh, and pastor glenn barrett last week shared in probably one of the best opening sessions i've personally been to in an assemblies of god conference about having thick skin and having soft hearts uh, and 
he was open and honest and vulnerable, sharing about how a person he'd done life with for a ministry with for 10 years. And that relationship was cut short and broken and, and gone in a sense in 10 minutes like that, just over. So you know, I've got my own wounds and my own heartache. I'm trusting and believing God for, for thicker skin and a softer heart than ever before. But you know, when people leave church, it's hard, even if it's done in the right way with the blessing with, with with just sending them out because there's a genuine gap in the congregation and when people just up and leave after years of doing life with them that bruises and that hurts and it's disappointing and you know what we've had people leave church during lockdown and that's the worst part of being a being a pastor i'm not going to mention names but the only sleepless and restless nights i've had the issues that I've had as a pastor for the last three and a bit years have been issues with people in church. Do you know what? I'm not going to fight to persuade anyone to stay. I'm not prepared now to fight with anyone in church because I don't have the time or the energy to, to, to fight with people. I, I just don't want to do it. Because it really gets boring having the same ridiculous accusations thrown at you constantly but what i will say and what i will do for anyone who's part of this church is that i will stand by you and i will go to war for you because that's what pastors do i was talking to a friend yesterday i met up with someone for, for lunch uh, and we were just reflecting on conference and um, i think pastor sammy rodriguez brought um, the, the, just the idea of, of pastors need to smell like sheep and I hope that I have that smell on me because I'm prepared to, to get in and get stuck in and help you and you know when that gets thrown back in your face it flipping hurts it really does but you know what I'm not alone Jesus experienced it on the night that he was betrayed he was betrayed with a kiss by one of the twelve and in the garden, they all scattered and left him. And he said, I should expect it. We should expect it too. And that message that Pastor Glynn brought was timely and powerful for me. But don't speak evil of anyone. And then you don't do what comes next. Once you speak evil of them, you start to judge them. And who are we? to think it's acceptable to judge anyone. Who made us judge? No one is the answer. There is one judge and he judges all. We've just read it in Revelation. Who am I to judge my neighbor? Who are you to judge your neighbor? Instead of judging them, here's an idea. Why not bless them for a, for a change? Why not, instead of speaking evil over them, speak something affirmative over them? Why not pray for them? Why not speak to them? Why not minister to them? Jesus said, Matthew 7, verses 1 and 2, do not judge, for you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. Jesus also says in Matthew 5, 30, uh, 43 to 48, You've heard it, it was said, love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people what are you doing more than others do not even pagans do that be perfect therefore just as your heavenly father is perfect do you know god has given us the ministry of reconciliation 2 corinthians 5 verses 11 to 21 the apostle paul is writing to the church 
And he says, since then, we know what is to, what is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God. And I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to condemn ourselves to you again. So we commend ourselves to you again. But are giving you the opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is heard, what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So now on, we regard no one from worldly point of view, though once regarded Christ in this way. So we, so we do so no, no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us a message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's our ministry, church. Love our enemies. Love them enough to pray for them. Love them enough to lead them into relationship with Christ. Why? Because Christ has given us the ministry of reconciliation because he's reconciled us to himself through Christ our Lord. I was talking to uh, my spiritual father a few weeks ago and he shared this incredible story of reconciliation he was talking about um, an elder in his church he was a pastor he was a pastor for many years and uh, he'd experienced an outpouring of the holy spirit and god had done a work in him and one of his elders came up to him and said you've got a demon in you and um obviously it caused a few tensions as you can imagine um this elder moved away uh, about an hour's drive from from where uh, he was a part of the church and time had gone by and about five years after this, this 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 statement was made and the elder had left the church and resigned and, and left um he got a phone call out of the blue from this guy and says i, I need to come and see you i, I can't sleep i'm restless i, I need to come and see you can I come and see you? He said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'll, I'll, I'll see you soon. So he made the journey an hour's drive to go and see him. And, and he's, he's wrestling all of these things inside of him. What's he going to say? How's he going to respond? What's he going to do? And he said, he came in up the stairs and into his office and they embraced and they hugged and they talked and they shared and there was tears that came from both sets of eyes and there was reconciliation and there was forgiveness and there was a moving on from that situation because God has given us the ministry of reconciliation to love not only our neighbors but to love our enemies and that's what Jesus did on the cross for those who may be watching who haven't experienced him or, 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 or have a relationship with him at the moment. He died. He took on sin. We've just read it in 2 Corinthians that he, that the one that had no sin took on sin for us, that we could be reconciled to God. The Bible says that God loves you, that the whole theme of the Bible is that God loves you. He's madly, passionately in love with you. But sin has entered in. From Genesis, when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, sin 
has entered into to mankind and we've talked about the evil desires and those evil desires just are just funneling sin out of us but jesus paid the price that you wouldn't have to be separated from god the bible says that sin separates us from god jesus took on sin that we could be reconciled that we could be reconnected back to god he died upon a cross three days later he rose again victorious what are you going to do with that information how are you going to respond to christ i'm going to pray and pray a prayer now and if you pray this prayer with me get in contact with us contact us at prayer.thestorehouse at gmail.com we've got a bible for you we'd love to connect to you um, and help you on your journey but pray this prayer after me dear lord jesus i thank you that you died in my place i thank you that you died for me that you loved me enough to die for me that you took my sin and my shame lord i repent of my sin i ask you for your forgiveness wash me in your blood fill me with your holy spirit and let me live for you all the days of my life in jesus mighty name Amen. Amen. I mentioned um, just a moment ago about the people that have hurt. And you know, this is my prayer journal. And inside my prayer journal is names and pictures of people within church, within my family. Um, and the, the, the people who have left church, their name is still in my prayer journal. Why? Because I still am praying for them. I'm still praying that God would bless them, would use them, would speak to them, would, would move in their situations, because that's what I can do right now in this ministry of reconciliation. I can pray for them. I can bless them. I can trust God to move in their lives. I want us to close in prayer that we can now respond to him that we can ask god to draw near to us as we draw near to him as we humble ourselves as we lay down our lives as we stick close to him he'll give us strength to resist the enemy heavenly father we thank you for your blood. Lord Jesus, the blood that you shed upon the cross that washes us clean. That when we come to you, Lord, we don't come to you, Lord, in our own strength because we never could, but Lord, we come now boldly into the throne of grace because of the blood of Jesus. We're washed clean, we're whiter than snow. Lord, you've taken off our filthy rags of sin and you've clothed us with, 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 with garments of righteousness, with, with robes of righteousness, Lord. And Lord, we do pray that you would help us. Lord, as we come again and we humble ourselves before you, as we submit to you, Lord. Lord, as we resist the devil. Lord, help us, Lord, to have clean hands and pure hearts. Lord, help us to, to express our deep gratitude Lord, for what you did upon the cross for us, Lord, as we, as we realise, Lord, that you died in our place, as you took my sin and my shame. And Lord, help us to stay humble before you. Lord, because you will lift us up, you will exalt us in the due time. Father, we pray. Lord, help us, Lord, with our attitudes. Lord, when, help us, Lord, to tame our tongues. Help us, Lord, not to judge others lord i pray in jesus mighty name amen god bless you guys